So just out of curiosity, of, of the people in the audience who actually met Hugh Daniel, like everyone? Half of them? Cool. So we might be telling you war stories that you've already heard, or if, if you have your own war stories, then uh, we have a mic and we would love to hear them and save them for posterity. Um, so please do, um, do come up and speak to the mic and uh, share with your stories. This is, this is not so much us speaking, uh, but it's all the interaction of all of us. This is, you know, for the people who weren't there when he, uh, when he died in San Francisco, and they had a memorial there, and we didn't really have one. At least I didn't have one. So um, I'd like to share lots of stories. And he's a good guy. I met him, so I'll, I'll tell the story uh, while John is still working on how I met him. Um, some people might remember a trip to Solips. Um, <laughs> Vesna and uh, other people know. Um, and the story is, our group of people had a sort of a pre-hacker space called the Hangout in Amsterdam. And we had a car with that group of people. And so we had a, two groups of people driving with a car. So basically, I owned a car and a half going to Solips. So by the time I got there, the other group of people who drove, I will not mention names, trashed the car so much that it couldn't drive anymore and it was stuck on the camping area basically not being able to drive so me having absolutely no skills whatsoever in, in fixing cars in the middle of nowhere um, sort of asked around my friends and quickly everybody told me you should find this big loud american he can fix anything so i ended up finding hugh and he came to me he walked up to the car uh, i told him what was wrong uh, he looked under the car <laughs> He wriggled something under the car, and then he told me, okay, now you should really drive very, very slowly to a mechanic, and these and these are the parts you have to replace. And the next day, that's exactly what we did. And so, I think my mic cut out then. And so that's how I first met him. And then, of course, you know, uh, uh, walking around and uh, talking while waiting for things and car mechanics, um, we, we started talking. And he's like, so, Paul, what do you do? Well, I, you know... I have this tiny ISP uh, in Holland, and you know I'm playing around with little Linux boxes on floppy disks. You know, one LRP for those people who know the Linux router project was a Linux router on a, on a single floppy disk. And he basically told me, you know, if you're having a 24 connection, because at the time that was pretty rare, like having a dial-up or like a lease line. Like I had a lease line 14k4 modem to my house, and nobody had 24-hour connections at the time. Uh, when when we started talking about that, he's like, you know, you should you should encrypt that. It's like, uh, okay. So he said, yeah, I do this freeson project, and you know, you should you should look at replacing it or adding it to your machine and doing that. So we ended up talking about it. It's like, yeah, well, crypto couldn't hurt, I guess. I didn't really see much use of it at the time, but um, but I started doing that, and I'm not sure how much time was between that and um, the next round of IETFs and other conferences in Strasbourg and other places. But basically, Hugh and me ended up touring Europe for three months, going to various conferences, doing free swan work, and telling people how to do opportunistic encryption and how to encrypt the internet. And you know, with the goal that you know, John Gilmore and, and Hugh Daniels started up with, with trying to encrypt the internet. Uh, what was it again, John? 10% per year? We start with 1%. 1%. We work our way up. So, so unfortunately, we didn't make it. Um, I think we're going to have a few slides, um, like two slides, with the idea that we had then, kind of explain why it failed, and actually um, the new idea that I had, that I'd actually been talking uh, regularly with Hugh Daniel with. Um, of course, the problem with Hugh Daniel, talking to Hugh Daniel when you're not in the same room is really hard. When you're in the same room, it's not a problem. It's the loud guy talking, and you have to talk to him because you cannot talk to anyone else. But if you're continents apart, then... It's a problem because, as probably many of you know who know Hugh, when you call him, he's going to say, okay, so uh, we have no crypto going, so can we set up crypto? My, my gateway is here. Uh, please set up your gateway with uh, IPsec and, and let's get this crypted. And then you spend two hours on the phone getting the crypto running, and then by the time you're done, it's like, you know what? Um, it's time to go to bed. It's late. <laughs> um, and the same with email. Um, one of the things I realized is when Hugh Daniel died, probably the amount of PGP encrypted traffic in the world halved. <laughs> and that's really, really sad. Um, and he was really good at it. He basically, whenever you sent an email, he would go like, 
That's an e-postcard. Everyone can read it. You didn't put an envelope around it. You must encrypt it. Why are you doing this? You should use these tools. We made them. Install them. And then you could say, like, hey, 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 yeah, but it's hard, and it's slow, and I have a big passphrase. And you know, even when I mail John, I have learned the hard way that if I mail John an encrypted email, I will never get a response, ever. <laughs> um, he's busy, I guess. <laughs> so, so I send him plain text emails. Um, you couldn't do that with Hugh. If you would do that, then he would get upset, and you would, in the end, lose more time explaining why you send him plain text email than just actually getting your PGP key and encrypting it. Um, so, so he was good, and I'm really sad that that driving force, that you know, crypto extremism, uh, has lost a good fighter. And so, one of the things I I try to do myself is get crypto going, that it's easier for people, and and take up some of the battles that he started. Um, I always complained about him doing all the battles at once. So. Um, if you were traveling with him, then you couldn't do anything that sh needed to show an ID for, that you uh, uh, that needed a credit card. Uh, what other things couldn't you do with him? You couldn't go to many places with him. Um, is, is Hinde here somewhere? Hinde and other people. I think Liz was part of the organization as well. Did, did a gig in Amsterdam at the Paradiso. What was it called? The, the next five years? The next ten years? Something like that. They put in a fake fingerprint reader security system and invited a couple of hundred people to go there and the, the, all, all of what they were doing is just monitoring and see how many people would object to this. So I was looking at it from like the first, second floor at, at the Paradiso and everybody was just doing it. Everybody was just getting frisked. Everybody let their fingerprints be taken. I think there was a fake iris scanner as well. Um, and everybody did it. And then he was staying with me at the time or with Pesna, <laughs> whoever's house it was, the landlord didn't agree. Um, so, so at some point we called Hugh and it's like, okay, we need to really get someone who's going to refuse this. So I called up Hugh and said, Hugh, you need to come. This is a great party. It's at Paradiso. Go there now. And so I remember being there with, I think it was uh, Jure and um, Alex, Alex Leheu. And we, we watched you make a mess <laughs> and explaining to everyone there why he will not give his ID to enter. He will not get fingerprinted. And it's sad to realize that it's only one guy out of like hundreds of people who actually refuse to do this. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm not really ready to take on that burden either because I want to have a life. And that's why all of us are not doing these things in the same extreme. Um, John's a little more extreme than me. Um, but so, so again, I, I wanted to do something a little easier. So um, OTR has been designed by the cypherpunks to be a really friendly encryption method for instant messaging. Who's, who here uses OTR? About half. Who here has always, encrypt always on and refuses plain text? For the record, one person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trusting this opinion entirely, but... <laughs> Um, and and so, so Hugh died on June 3rd, and it's kind of ironic because I think that's the same day that Ed Snowden flew from Hawaii to Hong Kong and started this expose of this giant massive tapping that everybody kind of said was happening, but nobody really had proof of, no one really believed it. Um, when, when people learned about Echelon, at first it was like, yeah, yeah, that's a little, you know, you're exaggerating. And then it sort of fizzled out. And now we're back, like this is version two, and we're back at, at the same thing. And now we know that in 2008, um, the NSA was already able to log three days of total internet traffic before they had to cycle through the, th through the content and go on. Not just, not just metadata or logging, no, every single packet. Every single packet in and out of the US in 2008 was logged for three days. So, so basically, it, it, I came to the realization that there's always a sniffer on the network. It's not just here the Wi-Fi where you have to be afraid of who's sniffing the network. No, when you send a packet over the globe, someone is guaranteed to copy it and analyze it and do something with it. And we really need to speed up this, this protection against this passive monitoring this passive attacker. And so OTR is a really easy way of doing that. If you're using an IM client, please look for an OTR plugin or see if the OTR support is there, enable it, 
and start telling your friends to do it as well and start the ball rolling. Now, this won't help you necessarily against active attackers, but you know, luckily most of us are not targeted by the NSA. So we're pretty safe, but we can make it harder by at least encrypting as much as we do and making it as tra transparent as possible. And that's what I've, I, I've been still trying to do. Um, the opportunistic encryption we tried 10 years ago, it sort of failed. Um, I'm trying to sort of restart that effort. Um, and at the same thing, I'm trying to make PGP encryption and OTR usage easier. Um, so I'm not sure if we have some slides for that at some point, but um, maybe I should let John talk for a bit while I have a sip of water because I have no idea what Hugh did before 19, when was Solips? 99? So I was actually at HIP. I was actually at HIP with Hugh, but I never met him, even though he was scanning PGP prints. OCRing and helping export PGP. Well, I guess while they're fighting the microphone, um, these are really old pictures of Hugh before I obviously met him. Um, So, um, I first met Hugh when I was working at Sun Microsystems in about 1982 or three. Um, Hugh grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he was part of the Xanadu project. And I don't know, does anyone in here know what the Xanadu project was? All right. Uh, this was Ted Nelson's dream of hypertext, which was later realized in a much different way by the web. And he was part of the crew that was actually attempting to implement this. They bought one of the first couple hundred Suns, Sun workstations, and I was working as an early employee at Sun. And they had some problem with it. And their tech support person said, we can't really, I can't help you with that. You'll have to talk to Mr. Gilmore. Because <laughs> I was maintaining send mail for them or something. And uh, so he called up Mr. Gilmore and he, he imagined this guy in like a suit or a white lab coat or something like that. And uh, when eventually the Xanadu crowd moved out to the Bay Area and he met me, he was like, oh, you're Mr. Gilmore. <laughs> Uh, and, they, and, and he and four other Xanadu people, who colloquially were known as Zanies, um, ended up sleeping on the floor of my bedroom for a month while they all found consulting jobs and found apartments and did all that sort of stuff. Um, so that was, that was my physical introduction to Hugh Daniel. Um, uh, we, we were good friends. We were very good friends, actually. Best friends for a while, uh, both living in the Bay Area. And uh, Hugh was one, of the, he was one of the people who came to the first meeting in which the cypherpunks were formed, uh, which was held at Eric Hughes' house. And uh, Hugh was actually the guy who suggested that we set up a mailing list to stay in touch which became the Cypherpunk's mailing list and was administered by me and him on my servers. Um, it turns out in between the Xanadu stuff and the Cypherpunk's, he and I also started a software company along with um, one other guy. And uh, this was a, a rather bizarre software company because Apple, had made Macintoshes, and they were selling pretty well. And then Apple came out and said, we're going to port Unix to the Macintosh. This wasn't Linux. It was like way before Linux. Um, but they, had a, they did a port of Unix called AUX. And when they released it, it had no window system. It was a Macintosh, and all it had was like a scrolling serial terminal. 
And we thought, well, that's stupid. <laughs> um, and so we took the Sun News window system and we ported it to run on the Macintosh and we sold copies of it. Uh, we got licenses from Sun, and which it was proprietary at the time. We tried to talk them into freeing it up, and they never did. Um, and we must have sold two or three hundred copies of this software, like one to everybody who bought Unix on the Macintosh. <laughs> and the problem with our business plan was that we believed what Apple was saying. They said, Unix is very important to us. You know, it's going to be a big marketing push. We're going to sell a lot of Unix on the Mac. But actually what happened is they did the whole effort of putting Unix on it so they could sell Macintoshes to the government. The US government at the time had a rule that said, we will only buy hardware for computers if, it runs, if it's capable of running Unix. Because they had been burned so many times by people selling them hardware that then only ran this bizarro operating system and could never be used for anything else, and they were locked into support endlessly, et cetera. So, so that was our failed business. And Hugh, actually, long after the rest of us quit on that business, Hugh was the final employee who was still out there supporting the customers and shipping this window system on 11 floppies. <laughs> So. so does anyone want to share one of their stories, or I'll just continue with another one of mine? Yes, microphone for the audience, please. I, I, I knew you uh, through John Gilmore, because I, at that time, it was in 2000, I was in correspondence with him. Well, I still am, but uh, at that time. And uh, uh, I told him I was in Australia with Macrolab in Western Australia. And just, just at that time, Hugh was also in Australia, but other, other end of Australia, actually. And John said, oh, but uh, he has uh, some time left. He has some time on his hands, so maybe he can visit you. And Macrolab is an interesting project. It's an art science thing run by uh, a Slovenian called Marco Pelhan. And it was set in an island uh, uh, just for, before the coast of West Australia, just before the coast of Perth, uh, Rottnest Island. And they had this inter installation looking like a UFO that would not go up. And, and you actually came at his own cost from the other side of Australia. And uh, he came there and he asked what... He didn't even ask, how can I be useful? He looked around and he started rewinding the whole place and making it completely... Uh, uh, what I would call free and open source software uh, com uh, uh, compliant, which Macrolab had not done yet, and, and we're very, 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 very happy to be able to do so. And, uh, and so we had we had Duke for something like a week in Macrolab, and uh, we also took him to uh, to Perth because that day there was uh, it was the first Friday of the month, so there was a 2600 uh, uh, gathering. And uh, he met the people over there and so on. They were not impressed because they would ne never heard of Hugh Daniels, but anyway. But my starkest memory of Hugh at that time, and that's why I admire him more or less boundlessly, is, well, you have seen the photograph. He was a big man. And he took so little place in that, uh, that macro-lab thing, which was, well, it, it, it was kind of submarine in, 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 in terms of space. You really... Uh, 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 you had he could pass each other, and I'd never met someone who took so little place in that that space. And uh, the lot of things he did, uh, it, it was pure it was pure enjoyment to have him. He was also very very uh, 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 happy guy, say, gezellig as we say in Dutch. So yeah, that's that's my memory of him, and I always kept it. It's, yeah, it, you're right. I, um, I actually at some point went and took the Orient Express, the train. Um, not all the way, because I guess it doesn't go to Russia anymore, but like to the parts of Austria and uh, when we were doing a little tour, visiting some conferences in ITF. And indeed, the, there were bunk beds in there. And you'll, you'll see, if you see a photo somewhere in here where his, his head basically covers the entire photo and you see some squares around it, that was like the entire size of the cabin of the, the train. The two bunk beds they were really, really small. And I guess at that time, I was already a little bit more indoctrinated by uh, John and Hugh. Um, we got on the train, and the conductor said, you need to give me your passports, because during the night, we're going to pass the border. 
And like, both you and me gave a really sound, no, <laughs> you cannot take our passports. And the conductor was like really confused, like, this has never happened to me. What the hell is going on? These two guys are weird. And um, so I showed him the last page of the Dutch uh, passport that says you cannot give this away to anyone. It's not your property. So I was like, hey, I'm powerless. I cannot do anything. So he was like, well, well, but, but then I'll have to wake you up in the middle of the night. And, and you know, if we pass the border, if they ask for it, it's like, yeah, sure, wake us up. Um, they never woke us up, so we had a nice... <laughs> 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 we crossed the border. They didn't see our passports. This was before Schengen. It was... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you have a story. And give your name. Hi, I'm Vesna. There was a photo just now of uh, my old house, or shall I say our old house. So uh, Paul and me, we were sharing uh, a house. We were roommates. And we had a lot of people visiting. We had a lot of hippies from hell parties there. And we mm. had Hugh and out you. there. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the corner. Is yeah. that me? No, uh, that's, no that's Paul. This is, is my that nose. Paul? Oh, that's your nose. Okay. <laughs> the orange, that's you. <laughs> yeah. It, the rest is me. And so we had, we had two sleeping rooms, and we had a third room, which was just like a closet. A, a closet, <laughs> basically, which we named Hugh's room <laughs> because he was one of our. Um, most frequent guests and uh, well he would basically fill up the whole room it was just mattress and that's it so he would stay there he, he would uh, sleep there and then we would go to the market sometimes and he would just enjoy everything he would enjoy walking to the market which was just like selling rubbish there and he would just find beautiful things in the Boston Lomer I mean for people who know Amsterdam he was able to find beauty in Boston Lomer <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also remember how he was fascinated with the mechanism for uh, that would lift the bridge to open up. And then he would explain all this engineering to me. I was like, come on, it's just a bridge. You know, <laughs> like I cross it every day, I didn't even pay attention. He would just explain all the different mechanisms for from one bridge to the other. Uh, uh, what was the challenge of engineering the bridge in such a way that, that it would open up in a certain way. So that was one of my memories of him. And once when I visited San Francisco, he uh, took me and uh, another friend to the hot springs. So he took us for a ride uh, outside of the city and, and we went to this um, beautiful nature place where the ocean meets the hot springs in the caves. and. Uh, we enjoyed it there, and um, I want to remember him like that. This is a photo of you, Daniel, in um, Strasbourg. We were looking at how the trams worked, and of course, you could see the driver part. So he spent all this time on a trip there, like, you know, <laughs> how does this work? Um, <laughs> and you would do that with everything. Um, I ended up seeing the last, uh, uh, second last space shuttle launch. I saw the Discovery launch. And it was actually Hugh who told me that um, he wanted to go. And he actually picked the second last one because it was like the last one will be full of you know, drama and lots of people. You should get the second last one. And so we made all this effort to do it. And unfortunately, he couldn't be there. Um, uh, mm -hmm. As you know, the Discovery flight got like, canceled once. And so I had to actually fly back to Florida for a second time. And I finally saw this launch. And, and just being around there, um, I really missed Hugh not being there because whatever technology was around you, uh, uh, he would just explain it to you. Like he would just go like, oh, this is how it works, blah, 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 blah. And, and so he was actually somewhat of a rocket scientist because he did work for some rockety company. I'm not sure exactly what. Starstruck, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, there, was, there was a rocketry company that he did do some work for, at right. least consulting. So, so, so I really missed him there, and you know, I did, I did call him from the causeway when the thing was launching, and so we had a brief chat. Um, and he was basically like, you know, this is the last time we're going to see a giant liftoff because now we're going to launch smaller things, and it's not going to be as spectacular. And um, he did describe going there himself, I think, 20 years ago before that, on the back of a pickup truck, when you could still just drive up to the causeway and go there instead of having these ticketing systems and and airport security. Airport is another one of Hugh Daniels terms. Mm -hmm. um, at least I come to think of it as Hugh Daniels. I don't know. You, you, the two of you spend so much time together, I don't really know. 
I think he who invented, originated what? <laughs> I think he invented a lot of these terms. Like he called Palo Alto shallow alto. <laughs> And uh, Menlo Park, which was the next town north, which he lived in at one point, was mental dark. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was very fond of railing against what he called the Linux children, who kept putting out releases of Linux that did stupid things, in his opinion. And, you know, we have to teach the Linux children about this again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we also have a new, in, in, so, so FreeSwan has gone through a bunch of iterations and a lot of open source drama. Um, it was called OpenSwan for a while, now it's called LibreSwan. Um, one of the things that, that we did there as well is that um, whenever Hugh did something, he would get easily distracted. So when you would give him a chore, like run this test case, he would find other things to do. And if you have a Linux machine that inevitably for him ended up recompiling KDE because there was some bug somewhere and he had to recompile KDE. So basically, that became a term in, 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 in our group friends. Like, if, if you didn't get your work done, it's like, no, no, stop recompiling KDE. Get back to what you're doing. <laughs> Do your job. <laughs> Don't get distracted. Yes, there are thousands of bugs that are worth reporting, but not now. Please stop. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and he literally was recompiling KDE on his laptop all the time because there was some kind of bug in it. <laughs> yeah. Patrice? Uh, Mike? Because it was also so typical. I learned from you the uh, uh, strange intricacies of the American constitutional system uh, uh, in, at home and abroad. And that was that you would tell you all kind of things, but no, he would not tell you unless it was a public meeting. Because mm -hmm. when it was a public meeting, then he was covered. When it was not, so uh, when it was not, he would be liable for, well, at that time was not as bad as now where you get for the Espionage Act for uh, uh, any, any kind of thing, but still, there were some kind of penalties uh, driving above you from the American government. Oh, then it, he would was, say, it was the export control laws about crypto. You weren't allowed to teach encryption to foreigners. Unless it was a public meeting, in yes. which case you were covered by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. So we had public meetings all the time. We had, <laughs> 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 we had to convene a public meeting and open a public meeting and have a public meeting. And then you would talk to, would talk to us. Mm -hmm. Another thing I noticed after Hugh actually pointed out to me, this is Hugh in front of an American embassy. You can actually tell the American embassy from all the other embassies. It's the one that's a fort, that needs so much security because the entire world hates them. Like, you can tell in any neighborhood, because normally the embassies are all, all together, you can tell which one is the US embassy just by looking at the building. The one that's reinforced that can take, like, you know, a truck hitting it, that's the American embassy. And he would always look at that and go like, this is freedom. This is what we've done to ourselves. Yeah. Actually, it's worse than that in the States. If you see a building that looks like a prison, it's probably an elementary school. <laughs> it's sad, but it's really true. They're like all surrounded by fences trying to keep the world out. Hmm. Uh, one of the, the things I remember from, from uh, you or... Well, what's you your name? Reinhard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many of the people here uh, probably were there. Uh, 12 years ago at HEL 2001, uh, you uh, held a talk and, uh, well, he made a little theater before starting, like uh, looking, okay, where, where's the emergency exit? Where should I run? And he started this talk by, you all suck. And that was the talk, uh, I think, about the, the Linux babies that uh, mm -hmm. had to be teached uh, what, whatever the, the Unix community had done 20 years ago already. But that, that was typically him. He, made a, 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 he was not only a, a big guy, but also had a very big presence always. But he made it, and he, he made his point uh, so clearly that 12 years later, I still remember it. So <laughs> that was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Hugh was a good teacher. He, he spent a lot of time around kids. He never had kids of his own, but he loved playing with kids and teaching them. He'd do his, this thing called Dr. Destructo. So he collected broken equipment of all sorts, but especially computer equipment. And then he would like 
tear it apart in front of a mess of kids and show them what was on the inside. So he'd like saw disk drives in half and you know, take the covers off and have the kids unscrewing all the little things inside a laptop. It was pretty cool. Um, he was also good at teaching adults. And uh, when my sweetheart Annie was working for Benetech, um, she did a lot of work on, w with the uh, Human Rights Data Analysis Group, which goes to trouble spots around the world and figures out statistically valid numbers about atrocities, like how many people were displaced from Bosnia, or how many people died in this year in East Timor. And uh, so all the people who worked on this project needed to have good crypto on their laptops because they were carrying around sensitive data about human rights violations. And uh, Hugh would come and teach Annie how to put crypto that worked on her Macintosh, which is something I would never touch because it was a Macintosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you know about his Guatemala adventures? I know just a oh, little yeah. bit you might know a lot more. So that, that project also did a bunch of work on human rights in Guatemala, in the Central American country. They had 30 years of civil war that only ended in the 80s or early 90s. And it was a really terrible time. Tens of thousands of people were killed, mostly by their own security forces. They wiped out a whole generation of of the intelligentsia of the country, the university professors and the good students and all of that. And so they've had a bit of trouble climbing back out of that. But it turns out that uh, records of that time were discovered. The police archives survived that period. And they were discovered in the 1990s after the police had told the UN, oh, we don't have any records. You know, um, some neighbors called the, uh, the human rights ombudsman and said, there's this building in our neighborhood and we're afraid there's like munitions in it or something. We were afraid, you know, it's going to blow up and can you come inspect it? And they inspected it, found a hundred years of police records from the National Police of Guatemala. And it included, you know, it, it was, ah, that's at Solips. Yep. And that's in my house many years ago, hacking on a, maybe an early Macintosh or something, yeah. Hey, John. Yeah. This is Trick. Yeah. So um, I, knew, I knew Hugh at the physical cypherpunk meetings throughout the 1990s. And, oh, yeah. Uh, You're in a picture that's coming up, by the way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're in this one. There, are, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so this is a field in Hungary, and there was a total eclipse, and the line of totality crossed this field, where there had, I believe, been a famous battle some hundred years before or something. Uh, Azora, I believe, was the the name of it. But uh, yeah, a bunch of uh, cypherpunks and people went after the CCC camp in Berlin. So, what I was going to say is. Um, I remember Hugh as being the person at the cypherpunk meeting that you wanted to be near. You would get the best stories. He was just fun to be with. And uh, part of why I always looked forward to, to going to these meetings. I don't know if I've seen him in the last decade. You know, I've, I've kind of wondered what was up with him. Um, so some of my, my memories are a bit hazy. And it's interesting. I don't remember, if, if you had asked me, you know, yesterday when I found out he'd passed away, you know, what, what my biggest memories of Hugh were, it was not that he was large and it was not that he was loud. It was that he was a really good explainer. He would listen to you and what you had to say as well. And he was awesome at, with children, like you were saying. He was a, a fantabulous teacher. And I, I also remember, yeah, his work phrases like shallow, shallow alto for many different things. He had his own name for them. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So on his last trip to my house, actually, when we were doing um, IPsec stuff, um, I just bought a pinball machine, a Terminator 2 pinball machine. And 
I, you know, I can solder, but that's about it. So I fix it only marginally. Um, and some lights were off. And so during our downtime when we didn't want to work on uh, looking at software, we, uh, we actually looked at fixing the last few lights on the pinball machine. So we quickly found out, well, Hugh quickly found out what was wrong and, 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 and wire-wise, which was broken. So we fixed it. We triple-checked everything. Uh, we were ready to turn it on. There was a loud bang, and the entire wire harness frame melted together. <laughs> and we found out that, um, yes, there was indeed a problem, and we had miswired it. So we spent the next day going through downtown, finding proper replacement cables, connectors, and everything. And we fixed it up, and in the end, it, all the lights were working, and everything was working. Um, by now, there's a few lights broken, so I'm not sure what to do. But, <laughs> but, but he was good. Like, he, he could really... He fixed a lot of things, like uh, from cars to computers to yeah, to rockets, I guess. Well, he never did make it into space, but um, his body has been cremated, and uh, some of the ashes are in, in planned to go up in a space shot next year. With uh, with a satellite that's doing a solar sail experiment, it'll be I think the second solar sail going into space, and the theory is they'll put it up into a fairly low orbit and then orient the sail and start using it for propulsion. And after doing some testing in orbit, they'll take it out to one of the Lagrange points and see if it can do station keeping just using the solar radiation to keep it there. So. Uh, that will cost about twelve thousand dollars, and we've raised about four thousand of that. If anyone wants to contribute to sending Hugh to the Lagrange point, uh, please talk to me. <laughs> the slogan is "Never a sale in fifty years." <laughs> uh, I guess I saw Hugh on May third at a party at Mark Lauder's house, and he was lar as large as life as ever, and. You thought he would be there forever. But I guess the message is, for me, is that people disappear at the most inopportune moments, and you don't get a chance to thank them. If they were important to you or <laughs> influential in some way. So take the time. If there was somebody who uh, was important to your career or your, listened to you at a, the right time, go thank them now, because uh, you might not, may not have the chance in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, let me actually continue that. I, the, last, the last couple of months in his life, I, um, I, only, I only spoke to him over the phone, but he, he told me he had vision problems. And it kind of freaked me out because he was a big guy. Um, if you get vision problems suddenly, um, then you know that that could be diabetes or something, and you should really look into that. And he didn't take care of himself. He should have taken more care of himself. He should have seen a doctor. And for whatever reasons, whether it was showing ID or not, um, he didn't do that. And I, I just really like to stress out to people, like you know, take care of your health. Go see a doctor, even if you have to show your fucking ID card. Like it's, they're not out to kill you. <laughs> Like, use it. And I know the, the U.S. healthcare system kind of sucks. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, just take care of your body. Just just don't treat it like it's always going to be there. Like, you know, treat it with respect. Uh, uh, he was also, let, let me, I'll, I'll continue. Until, if someone wants the mic, please let me know, because I, I feel oh. like I'm, I'm talking too much. So, so just feel free to grab the mic. Um, he was also pretty instrumental in the early DNSSEC and the early IPSEC uh, times. Um, when when FreeSwan was started um, and it wanted to do IPSEC, one of the problems was that it had to distribute public keys um, massively. Like Because the, the whole goal was that two machines who'd never talked to each other before would talk encrypted to each other. So you'd have to publish this key. So there were two problems. One, how do you publish this key and how do you put it in DNS? So that was one, one track. So you have to put it in DNS and then we secure the DNS. That took like 15 years total. And then there was the, the part where the IPsec actually took the key and then started to, to do things. So even though we didn't really succeed oh. at the second part. We have your slides on the screen now. Um, yeah, we could, we could, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it like this, I think. Okay. Um, 
So, so we got one part right. That is, we have now a secure version of DNS where you can publish information and that can, people can verify in a really distributed way. It's not really dependent on one entity. Um, there's a root key, but you, can, you don't have to trust it if you don't want to. Um, and it's a really good way against passive attack. And as, we've seen, as I've said before, it's really important these days because we know everything is getting copied. Um, so, so his early contributions to the IETF, um, I was there um, today actually, the IETF uh, um, uh, close today in Berlin, I was there in the last week. And, and people remember him for his, from his early contributions to DNSSEC and IPSEC, and though he doesn't have an RFC on his name, he would be the guy that would throw in a wrench and said, you cannot do this, this is totally insane, uh, you know, this is unsafe crypto, or you, know, you, you, you have to allow this or that. Um, he was really instrumental. People really recognize the, the work he's done at the IETF. Um, unfortunately, he didn't really show up anymore in the, la in the, the last couple of years. But, uh, but there were many people at the IETF that remember him. And, and I mean, he introduced me to it. I, I feel that I went from a little hacker in a basement to, to know these, these IETF people that you know, do protocol work that make computers work across the internet. And um, it's pretty important work to standardize that. And there's, there's difficult people in there. Um, and, and Hugh made it, made, he was a difficult person, but he made sure that you know, we had good crypto, we had crypto agility, we have DNSSEC now, uh, we have easy adding of new DNS records. And he was, he was a key player in all of that, even though his name is not on any of that. Hmm. He was a difficult person, to, a particularly difficult person to employ. Um, because uh, he he just didn't like paperwork, and so he didn't like when he was consulting, he would go and do the work, and then he would never send an invoice, and so you could never pay him. And I had numerous friends who you know basically had to write the invoice themselves, you know, get him to send it back in so that it could get paid. Um, when he worked for me doing the IPsec work, I would basically pay him in cash, right? When he got low on money, he would come by my house. I would hand him $10,000 in hundreds, and he would go off and do IPsec for X number of months. <laughs> he, he really didn't like paper trails and paperwork and databases and bullshit. And also, in fact, the first IETF, I, when I was in Vienna for me, um, I don't know what year, um, I didn't have money to attend, but I was on this little trip with Hugh, and Hugh had backing of some rich guy, and so he had phone calls apparently, and his, you know, he forced this rich guy's hand to pay for my very first IETF <laughs> meeting. Um, so thank you, John. <laughs> 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 You're welcome. I now pay myself, it's, it's, and I've sponsored people, so we're carrying this. Yes, on. pay it forward. That's the standard thing. Don't bother paying people back. Pay them forward. Pay, you know, help somebody else. Vesna. So it was about ten years ago that uh, I stopped seeing Hugh so often, uh, and uh, it coincided more or less with me getting children, and. Uh, he was still around uh, in 2003 when, uh, oh, 2000, when, when were you born? <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, 2003, and um, I wanted Hugh to be godfather of my children. Mm -hmm. And um, spiritually, he was for a few years, but practically he wasn't because we lost touch. And I'm really sorry about that. He was the most principal person that I know, and that, I guess, it's a good thing and it's also a bad thing, because I think that it did not help, did not help him to have an easy life, to, to have such strong principles and to suffer for them so much. I was looking up to him in that way, and I never wanted to do it that way. I was like, no, nah, Hugh can do it. He can have all the principles, <laughs> and that's not fair. And. Um, I will still remember him as the most principled person that I know. And if I ever want to teach some principles to my children, I will remember Hugh. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was also one of the kinder people I knew. Uh, it turns out he had a lot of trouble in school. 
you know, he, he was always failing in school. He just didn't fit in to the, uh, the regimented educational system. And I think as a result, he had endless patience for teaching things to people outside the educational system. And so one of the things Annie wanted me to say about him was that she never knew anyone who could teach people complicated things about computers so kindly and without ever making them feel stupid. Uh, this slide actually relates to that Guatemala project I was talking about. Um, so the, they had this national police archive in Guatemala and it's a huge warehouse and it's all full of paperwork that's filed and file cabinets and when they ran out of room they started bringing in burlap bags just full of documents and then it was abandoned for 20 or 25 years and it, so the whole place was full of rat shit and bat shit and it was a, it was a total toxic waste zone when it was rediscovered. Um, and one of the things that was, was not rediscovered was the index to where everything was. But they did find these eight inch floppies that were in some proprietary format and they were looking for someone to help them read these floppies. And Hugh ended up taking the job and he scoured eBay to, to buy old eight inch floppies, which you can see a, a run of like six of them here on the slide. And he found or put together or somehow cobbled together and soldered up an interface that could talk from a modern uh, computer to these eight inch floppy drives. And then he bundled the whole thing into crates and went to Guatemala to try to read these floppies. And uh, I think they succeeded at reading most of them. And it helped them figure out what was in this major police archive, which is still being explored. And, and actually, it was, it was used within the last year to convict one of the people who were responsible for the genocide. Liz? Yeah, I don't have a particularly good Hugh Daniel story, but I did want to say I didn't know the man very well. Uh, I met him at uh, various of these hacker conventions. He was at a few parties, hippies from hell parties at our house. But um, we actually visited, I think the last time I saw Hugh Daniel was in 2005, six, when um, my partner and I visited San Francisco and um, Hugh took an evening out to drive us around the city and show us all the sights. And um, he also took us to see something that we never would have found on our own, which is the wave organ. And uh, this is an extraordinary, I, I, I would never be able to find this thing, but it's this extraordinary space <laughs> underneath um, the harbor. Somebody help me out here, I can't even describe it. But basically what it is, it's these waves are just coming up through these pipes and making this extraordinary music. And it's completely spontaneously generated, generated by the, uh, the waves and um, the air and, the, and all the currents that are, 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 are sort of coming through the, um, all of these pipes. And it's a really, really remarkable place. And um, uh, I think that what we came away with from, uh, from that encounter with Hugh was just not simply that he, he had been so very generous with his time and, um, and so forth, but he had really sort of taken the time to show us things of his city that he was very proud of. And there's somebody from Amsterdam who has an awful lot of civic pride about my own home. It's, it, it, it's great to meet somebody like that. And uh, one other thing, I, I'm rambling a bit now, but one other thing was uh, uh, I always kind of thought of Hugh and John as something of a double act. <laughs> Whenever I saw the two of you together, you had such extraordinary chemistry, and I'd really like to offer my sincerest condolences because you must be feeling this loss very, very keenly. So. Well, it's, it's interesting because I've sort of subsumed the loss in the, in the work of cleaning up after Hugh. Um, he didn't get along too well with his family, and the result was his family and his friends never mixed. So I had never met his sister, but I met her the week after he died because she's his executor. And uh, 
she can use a computer, you know, the way sort of ordinary people can use a computer, but Hugh's lab was full of, oh, it had more than a dozen uh, sort of, you know, standard PC chassis in various states of disrepair. It had at least 10 ThinkPad laptops also in various states of disrepair. It had running servers that had VPN links out to other places in the universe that were serving up things for clients all over the world. Uh, it, it was a bit of a mess to sort of take it apart and clean it up. And I've been part of the team of three or four people who have been taking that stuff apart. My particular job is, is to deal with all the storage media. So I have about 100 disk drives that were found in Hugh's house. And I've been gradually going through them, looking for, oh, OK, this is an old backup of stuff we have erase the drive and then we can pass it on to somebody, et cetera. So I've been erasing a lot of drives and looking for things like where were his personal photo archives, which I still haven't found. Well, I'll have, I have five more drives from you that came from Access for All. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so I'll say one more thing. I think we have about five minutes or 4.2 minutes. So mm -hmm. the, the one quote that, that I always attribute to Hugh Daniel that is like the, the biggest one that I still use everywhere is when you're not on the net, you're not on the net. <laughs> when you're behind a net and you don't have a real public IP address, you're not really on the internet. You're in somebody's walled garden being locked up. And he was very, very critical of that. And even though within the IETF, that is still something people go for. In more outside of that, people think they take it for granted. If you're behind the net and you have a private IP address, then that's a way of normal communication. And he was really, really against that. Because once you're behind net, you lose the power to initiate connections to the world, to be recognized as a full peer on the net, and you become very susceptible to censorship, filtering, and other things. And it's really important that you have your own public IP address on your net. So. When you're not on the net, you're not on the net. <laughs> Pesna. Um, the, uh, Hugh took part in the movie Hippies from Hell. And uh, he gave the best definition of what the hacker is that I still cherish and, and reuse. Uh, his definition of what the hacker is is recorded in this movie, Hippies from Hell, and uh, it's a, uh, you can download it for free, you can watch it. It's a history of Hippies from Hell. Uh, it's been uh, 10 years now since that movie was made, and uh, there is a, a beautiful uh, uh, movie of Hugh in there, and uh, that's also something, uh, a way to remember him, to, to okay. watch it again. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, one thing, if someone has the recording of the radio interview that Hugh gave at, I think, Har, he gave a really long interview, or maybe it was... Um, Maybe it was held 2001. Um, there's a long radio interview of him, and I really like the audio from that. Mm -hmm. OK, any last remembrances? I guess we're done then. Thank you all for coming.